Welcome to Rewilding Love. This is episode 17, an interview with Dr. Amy Johnson. I'm saying all, all Angus's phrases, like everybody's batshit crazy, and we're painting ourselves in corners. <laughs> I was just loving the fact that Amy Johnson is quoting something that I said. When I identify more with what doesn't change, I actually get to enjoy my humanness more. When Rohini's nails bother you, we know. Ten years ago, I would have been horrified to think that I would even say this. We are habit-free. We are anxiety-free. We have everything we need. I have a greater respect for taking it easy and rest because of you, Angus. Our sweet little minds trying to help us and protect us. I have this vision of you coming home from work and walking around the house with a clipboard and doing quality control. When everything looks like it's going to be the end of the relationship, it's constant stress. You look like a giraffe who's just been, like, tranquilized. <laughs> this exercise might put me in a situation where the bar is being significantly raised. I'm taking notes, Angus. This is making me so emotional. I want to, like, go talk to him now. <laughs> you are listening to Rewilding Love with me, Angus Ross. And me, Rohini Ross. Rewilding Love is a podcast about relationships. We believe that love never disappears completely in relationships. It can always be rewilded. Listen in as we speak with our guests about how they share the understanding behind the rewilding metaphor in their work. And how it has helped them in their relationships. Relax and enjoy the show. We're really excited to have Dr. Amy Johnson on as our guest today. Yeah, Amy's a, a dear friend of ours, and it's going to be really fun to talk to her. Looking forward to it. And Amy is the author of The Little Book of Big Change, as well as the founder of The Little School of Big Change. Yeah, that little book of big change, change is the operative word. In my work at the treatment center, that book has, has really changed lives in no uncertain terms. It's become a bit of a Bible there. And also the school is a six-week online program, so that's even got more impact. No, for sure. Absolutely. And, and it's funny, uh, we're in a mastermind team together, and we've known Amy for now some years. She was, a, she was, I guess, a friend of yours before me. I think it's kind of fun to look back now because I feel like you had this mastermind going with Amy and a few other people, and a couple of people dropped out. So I was kind of invited, and I, I felt like I was kind of invited as a bit of a stopgap. Or at the very least, uh, I might be on some sort of provisional footing until you figured out whether I was actually going to be worthy of this mastermind team. But thankfully, I, I passed whatever test I needed to pass. But I remember thinking, oh, I feel like I'm a bit on trial here. And at some point asking is like, am I actually a member? <laughs> you were never on trial. I don't know, I guess not. But it was funny how I thought that. It is funny. In the early days where I, I was trying that hat on for size to think, oh, can I do this coaching thing? Well, I think the mastermind was pretty influential in our whole rewilding unfolding. It was for sure. Definitely. And the podcast. We talked a lot about this podcast in the mastermind, too. Right. She's been there right from the very beginning. She has. How <laughs> apropos that she would be our first guest. Absolutely. And Amy is just so impactful in the work that she does. But one of the things that I love about this podcast is you get a little bit of a sneak peek into more of her personal life. Yeah, it was a really fun interview. And you might notice as you listen that we have these little snippets that we pick out of the episodes to play at the beginning. And Angus started off doing the snippets and now I do the snippets. But when I was looking at the episode with Amy... There was so much highlighting going on because it seemed like everything she said was gold. So it, it took me forever to find choose the snippets. <laughs> That's a perfect segue into the podcast. What a great build up. Amy, thank you. Uh, Dr. Amy Johnson, should we go like that? I uh, know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for being our first podcast guest oh like, my gosh so I'm so honored for us no I am so honored I've I've been telling people I I know I've told you guys several times I'm such a fan of your podcast I feel I was telling someone um 
someone I work with who also is a huge fan of your podcast. She's like, do you listen to their podcast? And she has a whole ritual around listening to it at night when she's like doing her art. And I'm like, I listen to everyone and I'm going to be on it. And we had this whole like little freak out. So I feel like total fangirl. I love the podcast. I was on the edge of my seat, like what's going to happen with them. And I just love, um, I love being able to be in those sessions and then pop out and have you guys talk about it. I love how you guys banter off each other and like, I'm saying all, all Angus's phrases, like everybody's batshit crazy and like we're painting ourselves in corners, <laughs> <laughs> all the little stuff. I love it. Oh, wow. Thank that's you. A, that's awesome. And I had no idea. I mean, I know because we've been talking about this podcast for a long time. So I knew you knew about it, but I didn't know you were actually listening to it. So that's amazing. And I was really happy because, yeah, so we've been, I heard a little of the bits and pieces as it was coming together. So yeah, I feel like I got a backstage pass to the whole thing. <laughs> oh, that's great. So one of the things that we thought would be great in terms of having uh, guest speakers on is for people to get more of a sense of how broad this understanding is, how practical it is, how it applies to all different areas of life, not just relationships in the way that we've been talking about it. And so Angus and I would uh, love for you to share more about, uh, you know, the ways that you work and share this understanding with the people you work with. Yeah. It's so interesting that it is all you know, everything's a relationship in a sense. And, and, and so we have relationships with what appear to be other people, which are other people, but really, as you guys explore, we're, we're really in relationship with our own thinking about other people. We, we're all obviously in relationship with ourselves, which really just means our own thinking about ourselves or our own thinking in a moment. And so, yes, when I think about my work, I mean, it, it has largely, um, then, then for people who are struggling with habits or anxiety, although it is and it isn't, you know, that's kind of where people tend to be when they first come to me and we first start working together. But then as that clears up, um, they just see so many other things. And, you know, as, as you know, then it's like all kinds of relationships start changing. So, um, yeah, I primarily, I love to work with people with habits and anxiety because those are two things I struggled with myself for a long time. Um, from the lens of of seeing that we are habit-free, we are anxiety-free, we have everything we need, life isn't a problem, everything's okay, and we see and experience all of life through this revolving kind of lens of our own thoughts, you know, and, and our thinking by nature is very habitual because like thought is creative. The power of thought is fresh and new, but we're humans and it gets filtered through a brain and our brain spits it out in these very habitual ways, you know? So, so as people start to see, okay, what I'm hearing and feeling and seeing, it sure can feel like it's the same old stuff over and over again. And I can feel stuck in it, but I'm not that that's just the show that's playing. You know, I'm I'm something bigger than this conversation that's playing. That's where it gets amazing. And there's just so much freedom you can feel your way into. Mm. I wanted to I wanted to give you a, a big shout out for your book, The Little Book of Big Change, because um, I think, you know, in terms of what you've just said, I think that this is apropos in the work that I do at the treatment center. I go in a couple of days a week and uh, for the new residents that arrive in their swag bag is the little book of big change. So I guess we try and sort of actively encourage them to read your book. And for those that do, um, they're he always heavily impacted by it. But I, I just love the fact that for me, because your book is such a big and important backdrop to their experience uh, and the way that I teach and, and work with them, that book is always very, is ever present. You know, the, 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 what, what that book is pointing to is always ever present. And I feel like what I do there and what I learn there from my interactions with those guys and talking about your book really informs how I kind of show up and do the work that Rohini and I do in the relationship arena. It's, it's amazing how we're all kind of pointing in the same direction and it is so universal. And it feels like this understanding, it doesn't really matter what you're doing. We're all having kind of the same conversation. So I'm in a similar I'm having that conversation with the people in treatment. I'm having that same conversation, the people that we're working with on relationship. 
And I just love that. I love that element to this work. But I also wanted just to say how that book has just really impacted me and continues to impact so many people on a weekly basis, certainly at that treatment center. Yeah, definitely check that out. Little book of big change. And we'll include that in the show notes. Uh, There's something that you said, Amy, that I would love for you to just say a little bit more about in terms of how we are all habit free how, um, I can't remember all of what you said, but it's like, it really isn't a problem. And I think that I hear the truth in that, but I, I can imagine some people might be like, what, what is she talking about? So I'd love for you to share more about what you mean by that. You know, I think exploring this kind of distinction that most of us don't really explore naturally, um, between our experience, like what we think, feel, see, smell, taste, all of it, like the human experience, what the reality we're in, what what's going on for us in any given moment, that is always changing. It's, you know, it, it comes from thought, it's informed by our senses, it's this big psychological, physiological kind of mishmash of energy moving through us. And that's what that's what we get to live in. You know, it's pretty great when we see it that way. But, um, but I think I know for me, I think for most people like that was the end of the road forever. It was like, okay, well, this is life. You know, I'm feeling this, I'm thinking that I can try to alter my thoughts or feelings, but life's just given me life. And this is, this is as far as it goes. And, and what this understanding is really kind of opened up or has the can open us up to is like no there's a whole world beyond experience so what we think feel do say all of that is constantly changing and and the distinctions kind of between what's always changing so what we're experiencing and what never changes What never changes is a lot harder to sense sometimes because it's invisible. (laughs) It's not in our faces. It it doesn't have us getting in trouble or wrecking our health or wrecking our relationships or finances like our visible stuff does, you know, but, but to just even start with that, that little opening of, of like, wow, like there's a whole, what if there's a whole other world beyond how things appear? What is there? What's the backdrop? behind all of this stuff that just moves through us all day, every day. When people start to explore that, as you know, you know, like it just, it's vague and it's like, I don't know. And it's kind of weird at first and then it's not so vague. And then we get a feel for it and then we can get really familiar with it. And that's amazing. And that's when the scales start to tip a little bit where we're still human beings having all the thoughts and feelings that we have. But there's a bit of space between us and all of that. And it's more like we're just words, but it's almost like we're resting more in who we truly are and all the other stuff is going by. Like when you guys talked about letting the train go by, you know, the train just goes by and we're here on the station looking around saying, wow, there's a whole world out here. I didn't have to jump on that train. Sorry, Angus, I thought you were going to jump in. (laughs) No, no, I I was just uh, sort of somewhat... um loving the fact that Amy Johnson is quoting quoting something that I said but not choosing not to hop on a, on a train I was just sort of enjoying that moment I'm trying to hold back I don't want to do it too much <laughs> we can just fan out on each other here it sounds like <laughs> <laughs> The way that you just spoke to that so beautifully, Amy, that shift in identification, I think, is so powerful, where we tend to identify with what's tangible, what we see, as you're saying, what's constantly changing, whether that be our thoughts, whether that be our feelings, whether it be our behaviors. But as we look in the direction of what's beyond that, we might say the intelligence behind life, like what's that formless energy? What's what's that energy that drives the rewilding and the metaphor that we use, we start to identify less with what's tangible and more with our true nature, who we are beyond that. And it doesn't limit us from embracing what changes and being present to it and enjoying it. This isn't about transcending the human experience. It's about 
for me anyway, when I identify more with what doesn't change, I actually get to enjoy my humanness more and get to feel more and tend to make better choices as well. Yeah. It's like, it's like watching that action thriller movie, knowing you're watching a movie, you get to get fully into it. If that was you being chased by the bad guy, you'd, you'd be in a very different place, <laughs> but it's not. We're just eating our popcorn watching it. And, and um, yeah, I agree. I think there's such a sweet spot there and, uh, and it can feel at first like, oh, well, I, I'm not, I'll be detached from my life or, you know, all the concerns people have. But I, I think, like you said, it's just the opposite. Yeah, that's it, it's a beautiful way to just dip in more deeply and realize what else is there when we when we look in that direction. And I know you have uh, your uh, school coming up, the little school of big change to go along with your book, the little book of big change. And that's I've heard so many people that have participated in your program and experienced such profound shifts in terms of greater freedom from habits that they've been troubled with. And so I think it would be really great to hear more about how you see that supporting people in making those kind of shifts in their life. Because initially we're saying, well, you're habit free, but it does take some kind of um, effort in a sense to see that you're habit free. Like we can wake up to that in a moment, but often the conditioning is very strong. And so I think what the container that you've created with the school is really helpful for help, helping people wake up to that. So love to hear more. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think what you said is right on. It's like, first opening up to like, hey, we are habit free, we have everything we need, this is our essence. And we don't experience that a lot of the time, because like you said, the conditioning is so strong, like from the from the time we're tiny, we are pointed outward. I mean, even the fact that our eyes look out at the world and bring it back to our brains as if, you know, as if it's all out there coming in at us. So there's a lifetime, literally for all of us, a lifetime of conditioning. Uh, that we're we're dealing with, and and that's why I love this container of you know a group of people from all over the world, all of us just stepping step by step together in it with curiosity, with like what if, oh, and everything I do in the school centers around these what if questions. Like I don't I don't know how life works for sure. I don't want to tell anyone anything, but what if this is true? what if you actually are healthy right now? And what if this moving, changing, habitual, but moving and changing experience isn't you and it isn't personal and you don't have to get so wrapped up in it. And so, you know, we just kind of step through this exploration as a group and I, it always blows me away how much um, people see from each other. You know, and I know you guys run groups and you see this all the time, too, that it makes our job so much easier, too, that it's like, wow, look at all your peers, like people just open up. They're so vulnerable and honest and and what that does for everyone around them, because we're really all the same person. If we really were all so different as we think we are in our heads, <laughs> a group like the like ours wouldn't work so well together. But given that we're pretty much exactly the same, except the surface level details, which aren't that important anyway, <laughs> we see ourselves in everyone else, even when our circumstances are so different. You know, someone comes in with an eating disorder and, and I'm working with someone with depression and the person with the eating disorder sees their health through that conversation. So it's so beautiful that it's not about the details and the specifics. We get down to the universal part of life and that's where there's just so much power. Yeah, I think that what I've been noticing in the group, and, and we we had a conversation this morning in our group, is that people, um, you know, the, the Rahini reminded me of something that I, I feel like I've been saying a lot lately, which, you know, 10 years ago, I would have been horrified to think that I would even say this, you know, take me outside and shoot me if you heard me saying this. But, but now I very much embrace this 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 idea that we are we are a spiritual being having a human experience. And, and lately I've been saying that a lot, but I have now realized that what I've been saying is that we're spiritual beings having a human experience. And somehow we're still kind of these individuals in our, in our spirituality. And, I, and I'm glad that I, that I caught myself doing this this weekend because we are a spiritual being 
having this human experience. And in that spiritual being, it's a very level playing field. It's, it's universal. And I think that's kind of like at some point in the conversation, often I feel like within the group, we realize that and there's this beautiful space that kind of unfolds where everybody drops in and, and, and gets quiet. And it's just a really beautiful feeling that comes out of that. And that happened this morning in our, in our community. And I think there is something in that, that sort of universal quality of that space that, that people drop into by just having this conversation and looking in that direction. It's really quite magical. It is. And it's so against, again, all that conditioning and everything we've been told about fixing our problems. And no, this is a real thing. Therefore, I need to work on it. Like, yes, if you're in a, an addiction or anxiety or, or a marriage that's going not well, it's a real thing. But the therefore, I need to talk about it and look at it and fix it and work on it all the time. Like that piece is a little off, you know, so it's like, hey, there's something to see here. But when we see that, yes, that's the... That's the, the, the psychological piece of it. Just beneath that, always there is that shared. And that's, you know, it's like you guys yeah. said, like love can always be rewilded. It's always there all the time. And I think there's a, there's a relief in that, isn't that? When suddenly people realize, oh, like I've been, I've been sticking to this narrative for so long. And yet, actually, it's not real. That's not who I am. There's something far greater at stake here. And we all kind of getting a sense of that. I think that those are those moments that are so beautiful. Yeah, and I also really appreciate what you're saying, Amy, about the power of group and the power of looking in a direction together, that we see that all the time in our rewilding community. And that example of how someone that has what on the surface looks like a completely different issue you know, eating disorder versus depression, how the same understanding can have an impact and help wake them up from the same, you know, from the conditioning, even though the content of the conditioning might be different and the behavior and the way that it shows up looks different. It's the, the same understanding that has the power to help make those shifts. And when we, often when we're not being worked with you know, when we're hearing someone else be given feedback or we're hearing someone else share their insight, when we have an open mind because we're not thinking about our problem, that's so often when we get to hear something fresh and new that arises within ourselves because we're not focused on what's wrong with my marriage or what's wrong with my um, behavior, why is it this way? We're just genuinely curious, genuinely open-minded, and then bam, we get hit and it's so powerful. Yeah, it kind of, you know, makes you think whenever something feels really sticky uh, or we just can't see around it, there it's always because it's about us in our own heads. You know, you know, our mind has made it about us or it just looks so personal. And so that's why I think like you're saying, yes, when we're just listening to someone else, it has nothing to do with us. So we just get to hear it in, in such a different way. And so I just want to let everyone know, Amy does have a school that's going to be starting up. What's the date that it starts up, Amy? It starts uh, Monday, March 1st. And um, yeah, enrollment's open through that week. And you will be accepting enrollment on March 1st. I know this is going to air on the 1st, so people can still sign up. Yeah, through the 4th, through March 4th. Okay, great. So we'll include all of that information in the show notes. I can't recommend Amy's um, program more. It's just, I've, again, heard firsthand, not just from Amy, her experiences. I've heard those too about the wonderful transformations, but I've heard from many of her participants as well, because our communities often blend, which is really cool. They'll be talking about what they're learning with you, Amy, and they're sharing it in our community. And so, um, yeah, if it's something that interests you, we'll include the link in the show notes and you can go check it out. So, Amy, let's talk a little bit more specifically about relationship. Are you okay with that? So I'd love to hear um, for yourself, when you're married, correct? And how long have you been married for? Uh, it'll be 15 years this year. Yeah, so quite a while. So I'm wondering, I know for Angus and I, there was a big shift in our relationship pre-understanding versus post-understanding. And I would say that we might have been on the remedial end in the relationship area. So that was where we had a big shift. Angus, you're laughing. Do you not think we were remedial? Well, absolutely, yeah. 
I, th I think the relationship was quickly heading towards a cliff face. <laughs> or for about to fall off a cliff, should I say. So I want to acknowledge that not everybody has that kind of experience where it like the, the understanding tends to go to where it's needed most. And for us, it was really needed in the area of our relationship and made a pretty dramatic impact on us. So that may or may not be the case for you. But I'm just curious. We're curious to know if you did notice a shift or how it's it supported you in your life in terms of your relationship with your husband and your relationship with your kids or anyone else. I was probably pretty remedial. I think he was doing okay. <laughs> but I was definitely, especially in the early years, one of those people that was always um, in the name of, like, I'm going to make sure we get this right. I was always kind of predicting pitfalls, noticing things that weren't really problems, but could be that we needed to hash out before they became problems. <laughs> so there was a lot of that kind of stuff happening where my poor husband was like, is this an issue? Like, really? This is a problem? <laughs> He's like, I don't know. I don't feel it as a problem. And I, I could, you know, and a, a good example is I, uh, I remember really before we got, right before we got married, really having a little bit of a cold feet thinking about, it's so funny to, to even go back there and think about this now, but thinking about like us uh, when we were, we have a 10 year age difference. So I would imagine us at 60 and 70 wanting to do completely different things. Now, mind you, we were like 20 and 30 at the time, <laughs> but I, it was clear as day. It was so obvious where we were headed, you know, 30 years into the future, because, you know, as most couples, we have some different preferences. I'm a little more active. He's a little more relaxed. Like we kind of have a, you know, we have our, our differences, which um, haven't changed. They haven't changed at all, but they used to look in my mind like such a problem. And, and if not now, again, this is where my mind was always 10 steps ahead. If not today, like, sure, we're okay now, but there's no way this is going to be great 30 years from now. And, and you know, like, the, like it just sounds crazy to say that a little bit now. Not, not you know, it's a normal thing, I'm sure, that a mind would do. But um, so much under that umbrella of my mind looking ahead and predicting and doing all that has just changed so much. And, um yeah, now it just, even even if we're in a place where we want totally different things, like, like activity-wise, you know, like I do want to do something and he doesn't or whatever, like those differences for sure come up quite a bit. It, they just don't look meaningful. And it kind of surprises me to look back and think that I thought that was so important. Like if we didn't want to go on a hike together, that was going to mean something, you know? And now it's like, oh my gosh, like <laughs> it doesn't, just doesn't matter. So there's just so much on the surface, all the thinking about it and the meaning especially has just melted away. And, and then, so when differences do show up, they just don't look at all like I, like I, like they used to. This, this is a stupid analogy that comes up because I feel like for sure, I'm sure so many people think along these lines, but it's kind of like, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever done bingo, but I know that people who have and talked about it. It's almost like you've got to like let the numbers line up. And I feel like with my with our relationship, I was always looking, the numbers have to really line up. And then all of a sudden, no, they're not lining up. That really means something. We're doomed to failure. And then I can predict into the future is like, yeah, the numbers are not looking good. It's not going to like, I'm not going to be able to yell out bingo at any point in the near future. <laughs> That's a good analogy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it can look so serious when you're in it. When your whole relationship looks like that bingo board, it matters, you know, and it's kind of like we like we were saying earlier in the conversation, but when we get to back up a little bit and see, oh, no, that's just a bingo board. There's a whole other life, a whole other way to connect beyond that. Yeah, the bingo board in itself. It's just playing the game. That's beautiful as it is. <laughs> yeah, if, if it's, I'm trying to play with that metaphor a bit, but if you're not attached to getting bingo, then all of the numbers on that board can be really fun. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter how they line up. <laughs> and I think that's one of the things that we hear a lot, uh, and especially even over a four-day intensive that we do with the couple, the shift that can happen between how they see each other on that first meeting when we sit with them to where they're at when we leave, it, when they leave, it's, it's like that shift in it's the same person, 
right? Like you and your husband, you're the same people, but yet it can look so differently just because the difference that happens when we stop making that meaning up or we're just open to different meanings. I mean, we're always going to be making up meaning, but to see that the one meaning that we've been making up all along doesn't have to be the only meaning. Someone shared with me recently, and it was really profound, how um, it was kind of like your what if question, Amy. It's like, what if my partner has loved me all along? And that flipped everything for them. And I just thought that was so beautiful because that was not the assumption that they were operating from. They were operating from the assumption, my partner doesn't love me. And life looks one way when that's the assumption, but it's like, well, what if my partner loves me? And then a whole different world gets created from that. That's that's amazing. It does. I mean, everything follows from whatever we're starting with. Our brain just finds evidence for whatever we expect, you know. I can see a lot of that too. And and so that kind of is, you know, I was, uh, I didn't see a lot of great relationships before mine, you know. And so I just kind of anticipated problems because that's what I was familiar with is problems. And, um, and there was a lot of filling in the blanks and well, what are our problems going to be? Cause we're definitely going to have them. And, you know, and I think there's some truth to that, but I, I was holding problems as like a really deep, meaningful, serious thing, not how they look now. Um, I, so much about having a sense of this understanding is so like, it just keeps our thoughts so fluid and I think allows us to just have insights so naturally so in, in thought that otherwise would be kind of invisible gets to be more visible. So I, I recognize too, I had a whole thing about my husband. Um, it would drive me crazy when he would spend a lot of time watching TV and he would, and he does, he still does. That hasn't changed. Um, but he, you know, he's a super chill guy. He just likes to relax. He's a lot like Angus. <laughs> he's uh, He's just like laid back, just kind of, you know, but he likes his downtime and I'm not like that so much. <laughs> and, um, and I recognized that I had so much thinking about early, early on that, um, I would see him doing certain things and my mind would fill in the blanks to again, see him turning into his dad or like turning into his parents. And I, and it would just complete this whole story that was so fabricated. And it's kind of like, kind of what you're saying about that what if you know I just it was an unexamined belief I had I didn't even know I had it and and as I just kind of got out of my head in general a little bit more a lot of this stuff now when it shows up it's hard to explain but you know I like it it kind of pops out like oh that's what I was thinking you know so there's been so so many of those assumptions and you know it still sort of habitually drives me nuts sometimes when the tv's constantly on but but I see it (laughs) like I know where my mind's filling in a story and and then it comes back to here and it's like in this moment is the tv a problem no what would be a problem (laughs) is my husband becoming his dad and all this other story but that's not happening what's happening is he's had the tv on all day I love what Amy was saying about the fluid nature of thought. There's something for me to sort of, that's a growing edge for me there. I feel like there's an insight in the making to look in that direction. I I feel like so much of what I do is informed by, you know, the little book of big change in terms of the way that I see how you're pointing to the biology behind thought, the biology behind habit. I think that's such an exciting reference point to begin this conversation And what you were saying about the fluid nature of thought is that when I do groups, I talk about the biology of thought and I talk about it being kind of like the screenwriting software of our lives is how we constantly kind of creating narratives. And it's interesting to consider it on those terms. It's like, am I going to like follow the narrative or are I actually going to follow the fluid nature of of thought? And the fluid nature of thought very much is encouraging me to look in the direction of my intuition and that intelligence. And that is a whole different way of showing up that there's just to constantly rely on the old habitual thinking. So I just love that idea, the fluid nature of thought. And you, Rohini, were talking at the weekend something about 
the neuroplasticity of the brain. And in a sense, it's like, yeah, it's constantly changing and we can really celebrate that possibility rather than get so stuck in our ways. Because we are creatures of habit. In a sense, we're designed to be creatures of habit. You look at our biology, it, it's set up for us to be creatures of habit. But understanding that really allows us to sort of start to to have a different human experience that's not based on water under the bridge. That's based on, yeah, let's live in the moment. Let's do life in the moment rather than, you know, what happened yesterday or last week and, and, and be kind of gripped by that. And I think, too, seeing that our patterns are those, the habitual places our mind goes, um, they're not, again, they're not personal. I know people sometimes have a hard time with that because it feels like they're personal and they're coming from our childhood or wherever they're coming from. But, but yeah, that's just the biology of it. That's just how the machine works. So, you know, I got so much out of listening to your podcast, just, just seeing things and from my own relationship around their dynamic and hearing a little bit about your, about your dynamic and, um, you know, like Alicia was very volatile and, and you guys said Rohini can be volatile. And then there's this whole thing, there's a reaction to that. And, you know, and that's like what people feel like they get caught up in. And me too, at times, like for us, we both had a lot of volatility in our family. So we both go the other way now. So we have this tendency when, when our thinking is out of whack to just both go inward and shut down and we can just be ships passing in the night for a while until we wake up and say, Hey, we haven't talked in a while. We're both very happy just being introverts and not talking that much, but that has its things. And, and for a long time too, that looked like, wow, there's something in that psychological pattern that means we're not going to work together. We're not good together. We need to fix it. We need to get to the bottom of it. And now it just looks a lot more like, um, it's not me. It's not him. It's the culmination of all this stuff and our, our sweet little minds trying to help us and protect us and saying, we don't like yelling. So let's just be quiet. And then our minds take it too far. And then we just wake up to it when we wake up to it. But you know, it just doesn't, it just doesn't mean anything about Amy and Aura as a couple together. And that is huge. It's huge because the patterns still happen sometimes, but the, the bounce back is quicker and the, the meaning is not so much. Yeah. There's such freedom in that. As you're, as you're talking about it, I was, it occurred to me, I just had this thought like, oh yeah, my operating principle was, you know, when Angus abandons me, that was the premise that I would work from. Like when he abandons me, this is how I need to take care of myself. And abandoning me could mean leaving me or it could mean dying, you know, or it could mean being mean to me. Like it was just like this whole range of when Angus abandons me. And, and that would be what I was constantly trying to protect myself from. The way that you're describing like, oh, you don't want to have conflict. So you go into the, the quiet mode and it's like, oh, wow, that's so helpful to see that. And see, like you said, your sweet little mind, like that's just what our brain is trying to help us with in terms of our survival. And that when we can see it for what it is, we have perspective on it. And even if we still do the things that we do in terms of the self-protection or even still create that meaning, having perspective on it is such a game changer because I always used to think that, well, it's not about having perspective. This has to be got rid of. Like I have to stop having this operating principle or I have to, you know, never thinking that those thoughts again. But what I see now, which is such a relief, is that one, losing perspective is okay because it can come back. And that two, when I have perspective, even if I'm engaging in a behavior or creating meaning that isn't really serving me in the moment, it's a blast from the past in a sense, it takes the pressure off. Yeah. I love that. Just knowing we, yeah, we, we fall into these, these little patterns and habits, but the perspective on it is huge. And I, and I really appreciate that. Um, I can see how sometimes for some couples, the, the psychology, like the patterns, it, even with perspective, right? It just gets to be too much. Sometimes people just say, Hey, it's, this just isn't working out. But I, I don't know. There's a whole, uh, 
whole level of kind of relief or freedom or something that comes from this understanding that even then that's okay. Like, mm -hmm. like even, you know, even if it, if a relationship doesn't work out the way we intended it to, we only intended that with our minds anyway. <laughs> like we make up these rules, right? About how it's supposed to look. So it's like, that's not, you know, typically what any married couple wants, but it's just so nice to kind of see, hey, sometimes our psychology is really strong and people move on. And even then, because again, my, my parents' divorce was not a friendly one. Like it, it can be a friendly separation for people at times if it comes to that. So much of it is is uh, from is is thinking about state of mind, you know, going back to the, the to to what you were sort of highlighting or lowlighting, as the case may be, in terms of our marriage. Um, for me, it was like there were oh, I would get into this sort of pattern of thinking around they're not going to be enough bingo moments, it's like, and I need to really teach her how to play bingo if this marriage is going to work properly. And for me, that just surfaces when I'm in a low mood, when I'm in a low state of mind, I'm projecting all, all over you in that respect. But it's also worth considering that, you know, that a lot of those narratives were born out of me having a low mood per se. So if I start really getting hip to my state of mind and look at it from that vantage point, then yeah, why would I start taking my thinking nearly, nearly so seriously or in, a, or, or in a better way, that becomes an indicator to me that my, my thinking has gone south or my state of mind has gone south, best best not to engage at this point, or at the very least, that will be where I can start to get neutral. Yeah, yeah. when Rohini's nails bother you, we know that's your... <laughs> exactly. That's is this best, creepy? See, now it feels like best, I've been like stalking you guys or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you probably knew, knew yeah, that already, I mean, Amy. Yeah. I was going to say for full disclosure, because uh, Amy, you know, we've known Amy for a long time. And when we started to hear how similar some of the dynamics were in your relationship and kind of like how I'm a doer and I like getting things done and, you know, rest, who needs that? <laughs> not, not that I don't think rest is a good thing, but Angus is a lot more um, mellow, likes to take things at a different pace. He's like, I don't know if you should be spend, hanging out with Amy. That's right. I know when I when I've run out of wiggle room to blame Rohini for all my woes, I can I can always then turn to Amy because he's like, you're learning it from her. <laughs> well, I'm glad my husband doesn't know you guys because it would probably be the same thing. <laughs> like no more Rohini time. <laughs> And we all know Angus's sacred Sunday. I know that's been <laughs> that's been violated in no uncertain terms of late. <laughs> anyway, it, it, but I do. I have a, I have a greater respect for taking it easy and rest because of you, Angus. So I think we balance each other out well. And I've learned to work a little harder too <laughs> because of you. <laughs> We have some questions that we were going to be asking all our guest speakers, and they're just kind of like improv. So whatever comes to mind, are you open to playing with us in terms of these questions? Yeah. All right. So Angus, you ready? Can I, can I start? Yeah. Okay. So the first one is, what's one of your fondest memories in your relationship? Oh, wow. Um, there's, oh, there's one image that, <laughs> that I always go back to. Um, the night before we got married, he we got married in Chicago. We lived in Chicago at the time, and he was staying in the hotel where our where our guests were staying. And um, it's just it's not anything even that special. But you know, just you asking that question just brings back this little moment of just this little like wave goodbye, knowing like tomorrow was a whole new whole new start was going to happen, and um, our wedding was so nice. And you know, I I. I don't know. One of the things I love too. Sorry, I won't go on to this too much, but um, that I just it resonates so much about your rewilding concept and just bringing this in. That literally, like, you can ask that question, and I can go back to almost fifteen years and just feel that. If you know, if our experience isn't coming from the inside out, I don't know how the heck that would make sense because <laughs> that was almost fifteen years ago. You know, so it's just that a question like that can like make me all giddy. That's awesome. Uh, and then you, we, we're on Zoom doing this, so I know it's just going to be audio, but you should see Amy's face when that memory, like, it was just so beautiful to just see that fondness. It's lovely. Yeah, that's so gorgeous. Thank you. Okay, well, I get to ask the next question. 
What is one of the funniest memories in your relationship? Oh, gosh. Um, there's been a lot of funny stuff with our kids, like since we've had kids, you know, actually, one of the funniest ones might have been last night. Like my husband is um, six foot three, like 220 pounds. Like he's like this big guy, right? And my kids are nine and 11. They're kind of little. And uh, <laughs> my son, who's nine, is super into karate. Thanks to Karate Kid and now Cobra Kai, he's all into fighting. So he always wants to spar and do all this stuff. And um, <laughs> and my uh, my my big husband, he, he asked my son Miller asked for a um, fight, just fight, don't fight hard, just fight the way one of my friends would fight. <laughs> and Aura's like, like we always kind of make fun of Miller's friends. They're kind of funny. So he he does this thing. I can't do it. You won't see it on the on the audio. But um, he does this dance with the craziest face, and he's like coming at my son with all, all of his like limbs flailing all over the place. <laughs> and we ended up calling him. We, we say, you look, you look like a giraffe who's just been like tranquilized, <laughs> like hit with a tranquilizer gun. <laughs> That was literally last night. There's a lot of funny stuff, and I and I love I love having kids. You know, I mean, our kids just for both of us bring out our humor and make everything light. It's funny when you're sharing that. I love I love that picture. It sounds like a perfect TikTok moment. But the it just I got this memory of our kids one time. Um, I think we all had the stomach flu, and they were both. I think one of them was like maybe one, and one of them was three. And we um, kind of slept separately because they both weren't well. And there was in between the two bedrooms was a bathroom. <laughs> and we ended up, both of us, in the bathroom at the same time with each child throwing up at once. <laughs> and we just burst out laughing because we were so exhausted. <laughs> we're like, we're either going to cry or we're going to laugh. And we may as well laugh about it now. But I know kids definitely give us those memories. Um, so a little bit more serious on this note, but you don't have to take it seriously. It's like, what's one of the most difficult times in your relationship and how did you get through it? You know, I think, um, honestly, like we, we haven't had a lot of really prolonged, big, hard times, but I do think, uh, probably in recent years, you know, when life is super busy or even now when life is a little bit less busy, but we're all under the same roof 24 seven, we haven't had a date night in over a year. Um, there's just little moments and the kids seem to be always around. So there's maybe an hour when the kids go to bed before I fall asleep. Like, you know, it, I just have such a respect for how we can, it can get tough and how we can just fall, fall into this. Like, uh, is it really worth the effort? you know, like we both are tired and busy and everything else. And just, and just to see how, how more often than not, we kind of take that nudge and say, yeah, it's worth the effort, you know? And if it's not right now, like, don't worry, we don't have to make it mean anything. We'll get back on track, you know? But I do think, yeah, in these early years of not even little kids, but for us, I think maybe our kids being like kind of five to 10 range, there's just whirlwinds of activity and stuff and very easy to kind of lose connection. Yeah. And I acknowledge you, especially during this time of a pandemic, having young kids that, that definitely shows your grounding to navigate that. <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> I don't know how well, how well I would have done in those under those conditions or these conditions. Okay. So next question, how do you divide domestic labor in your relationship? Oh, good question. Um, well, my husband uh, is primarily home with our kids and taking care of the house. So, and I'm primarily working a lot. So um, it's kind of easy in that way, really. I mean, we sort of have an agreement. It'd be a lot harder, I think, if we both worked uh, and we had to navigate that. Um, that said, uh, I like things cleaner than he does. <laughs> So even though I work all the time, you know, by choice, I work a lot by choice. Um, and technically the home is kind of his thing. Uh, that doesn't really stop me from kind of making lists and saying, hey, you know, I think this could be a little cleaner. Or why don't we uh, <laughs> why don't we look over here this week? Focus on this when you have some time this week. Um, we have those conversations almost every weekend. 
And sometimes there's a little tension around them, although that is another area that I really want to like, that I'm really proud of us, you know, that we've, it's, it's not easy for him to have me tell him what to do. No, <laughs> no doubt about it. And, and I try my best and, uh, you know, but yeah, sometimes there's a little tension. A lot of times less and less now there is. A lot of times there isn't. But even when there is, it's like we kind of give each other that look. We know what's going on in each other's minds. And there's, tag in general, this kind of sense of like, okay, yeah, we're a little on the nerves right now. But just go do our stuff and we'll come back together and it'll all blow over. I had this vision of you coming home from work and walking around the house with a clipboard and <laughs> doing quality control. I have a white rag. If there's any dust on my white rag. <laughs> no, yeah, white, white gloves. gloves. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not that bad. <laughs> Luckily, Angus likes things cleaner than I do, so he tends to do more of it anyway. I benefit from that. And so how are the finances handled in your relationship? Well, it's interesting. When we first got married, we kept things separate. We, you know, I was 29 and he was 39 when we got married. So we both had a little bit of a history of having separate and there was no reason to combine. But when our daughter was born, three months after our daughter was born, he quit working. Um, so everything's just obviously been all together since then. And it's pretty simple. I mean, we that's never been an issue for us. He pays the bills. Most of it's auto pay by now. <laughs> but, you know, we both just know what's there. And, yeah, he takes care of most of that. That's great. Oh, it's just me, isn't it? What was the biggest misunderstanding you woke up from in your relationship? I think around that bingo card and around the activities, you know, again, when it just looked like, a good relationship looked a certain way. It looked like you have these things in common. You spend time this way. You do all these things, and it that was almost it was going to be a losing battle, right? But but kind of saying, oh wait a minute, what if it's none of that? What if we can still have a great relationship even when we're super busy and we haven't really talked in a day or two? And you know because it's deeper than all of that surface stuff. So I think you know, to borrow what you guys talk about, knowing that that love is there and and whether we're feeling it or not in a given moment kind of isn't even all that important. That sounds weird to say, but it's not. It's like, you know, and I can remember, I'm sure many couples have this where like early on when, you know, maybe six months in when we kind of hit that point in early dating where we sort of knew we were in this, you know, like where every fight wasn't going to be a breakup. We're kind of like, okay, like we're doing this together. So now it's a whole new level. We're just going to work it out. And that's more and more. That's obviously now, but you know, more and more, that's how it feels. Like none of this surface stuff matters that much. Yeah. That's so freeing and takes so much pressure off. We talk about that a lot. Like when everything looks like it's going to be the end of the relationship, it's constant stress. And when it's just like, oh yeah, this is all just normal part of being human there's just such a relief in being able to go oh, we'll work it out even if right now i'm not feeling the love it's okay and now it's not about the end of the relationship because we know that's not going to happen but it's about the connection like knowing the love and the connection is there even when we aren't feeling it in every moment it's yeah it's huge what's one of the favorite things your partner does for you he does so much for me <laughs> he um <laughs> he's he does a lot for me. What's one of my favorite things? I mean, he he's constantly listening for, I don't give him enough credit for this. I'm going to go thank him for this after this call. <laughs> now that you ask this question, it comes up. But he's constantly listening for like little things he can do, you know, because he knows I work a lot. You know, you know he, he, he gets it. He cares so much about this work that I do, even though he's not in this conversation a lot. Um, he has such a respect for the fact that what I do helps people and he contributes, he contributes to that so much. And he, I think he takes a lot of pride in that. So he knows that when I can go do an event somewhere to be able to do that and know that the kids are fine and the house is fine, everything's taken care of. That's the only way I'd be able to do that, you know? So he, I think he really feels like he plays a role in all of this and he absolutely does. He should feel that way. So I just think that's really sweet. It's not like Amy and her career and then me and my thing. I mean, he sees this as a partnership, even though it doesn't look like one from the outside in the traditional ways. 
Yeah, well, this exercise might put me in a situation where the bar is being significantly raised. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes, Angus. I'm worried. <laughs> I'm going to get to spend even less time with you now, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is the least favorite thing your partner does? Uh, watches TV all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's easy. This might be a, a non-issue given what you said, but just, and again, you can take it lightly, but what's one of your relationship deal breakers and why? Yeah, I don't think we have any deal breakers. I mean, you know, like abuse would be or something like that perhaps, but uh, we don't have any deal breakers that really, really even come up. You know, I think for both of us, the worst thing that comes up is just feeling not seen or heard. You know, like that's kind of about as as bad as it kind of gets, and that's not fun. But yeah, I don't I don't know though there are any real deal breakers. How do you keep physical intimacy alive in your relationship? Well, we um, we notice when it hasn't been alive, and we just have to make that effort, you know. And it, and really, there's a this is something he's amazing at too is is uh opening up the definition for all what what all of that means because it doesn't take much for either of us but it you know it doesn't take much meaning like he'll just like see me in the kitchen and come give me a hug when we haven't connected in a little while and that's all it takes that's all it takes to kind of melt the ice open the heart you know and and it's just those little things that kind of kind of need the consistent effort so he's much better at that than I am I will say that but it's just the little things here and there that kind of feel help us feel connected not just like parents or partners in a home yeah that's so so key so I have the final question if you could if you could only say one thing to your partner what would you want to say to him this is making me so emotional I want to like go talk to him now (laughs) um I think, I mean, I think I would really just want him to know how grateful I am for him, really. Like, he, you know, I love him, of course, there's all that stuff, but I just want him, would want him to know that I do see and feel and know his heart, where his heart's coming from, even, you know, even when things are tough, I know he's always, he always has that, that, uh, that love that's where it's all coming from the goodwill is always there for him and it is for me too but it's really there for him i know he cares so much and um yeah i'm just really grateful for all the little things he does that's beautiful i love just feeling that level of warmth and and love that comes through you for him and what an amazing partnership the two of you have thank you yeah it does it sounds spectacular Well, thank you, Amy, for being our first guest and for everything that you've shared. We're really grateful. And uh, as we've mentioned, Amy has an amazing book, The Little Book of Big Change, one of her books, but it's one of our favorites. Um, Her course, The Little School of Big Change, is starting on March 1st. Amy also has her podcast, uh, Changeable, so that comes out every week, and it's really insightful, informative, inspiring. So highly recommend anything that Amy's up to. (laughs) We're big fans. Yeah, Amy, thank you so much for getting us off to a flying start. Thank you so much for having me. This is like such a thrill. I can't believe I got to be on your podcast. (laughs) Are you going to listen to yourself? No. (laughs) This will be the only episode I don't listen to, but that has nothing to do with you. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening to Rewilding Love. If you enjoyed this podcast, please let us know by subscribing on iTunes. And we would love for you to leave a review there. iTunes reviews will steer people to this podcast who need help with their relationships. If you would like to learn more about our work and our online rewilding community, please visit our website, therewilders.org. Thanks for listening. Join us next week.